So we can't start without doing our review. This is our sixth session of Exodus. And each session, each week, we've done a review of the prior week's session. And I've done that, uh, well, I, it, it's seemingly unintentional, but it is for a purpose right now. And that's to see whether you're retaining some of this information from this book, uh, because we just keep going over and over it again. So I'm going to give you guys a little pop quiz and you guys can, can answer uh, however you see fit. Uh, you know what? I'll ask people individually. <clears throat> Miguel, what's the opening scene of Exodus? They came out of Egypt. Yes. And the people, okay. And the people are being persecuted, correct? Right. Okay. Yes. Um, Tatia, this is going to be an easy one. Yeah, I got to ask like you. I got to ask you because I know you know the answer. Who, who does God preserve for his purpose in this book? Who's the one person that we're, that we're paying attention to? We're reading about him a lot. Jesus? No, although I do like that answer because he is on the pages. But we are, we are looking at Moses. Moses is all over, the, all over in Exodus. That one. Yeah, Moses. I, I should have guessed that. Uncle said he got that. Okay, Uncle, this one's for you then. How does God reveal his presence to this man? I even I even hid it in the next question so you wouldn't know it was Moses. So how does God reveal his presence to Moses? Well, didn't he do in like fire and nighttime or yes, it, uh, you're absolutely father. right. In the in the very beginning, he revealed to himself in the burning bush. That's where we get Moses in the burning bush. Good job, Daddy. In the daytime he was he did with the clouds, I think. Like that. Right. That was after they exited Egypt. So oh, yeah. the last question that I had, and this was going to be for Micah Shelley, is how does he display to the elders that he has been sent by God? And God gives him these three signs, right? His The staff that he has on the ground turns to a snake. His hand turns white as snow when he puts it under his pocket. And then he's able to pour water out onto the ground. And before it hits the ground, it turns to blood. Okay. <laughs> last part of our pop quiz. Bam. What does God say his name is, Miguel? I am. I am. Oh, that's hard. All right. No, I love it. <laughs> Miss Vicky. <laughs> yes. Who else holds this title? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> who else holds this title? Who, who, who told the... The Pharisees and the priests. Oh, Moses? No, no, no. No. In the New Testament, who did? Uh, okay. I'm so, in, I'm so bad in memorizing. It's all this. good. It's all good. Jesus held that title. Oh, okay. yeah. This is where this is where we we start those discussions when it comes about <laughs> the Trinity, right? Because God God is the preexistent one. He his. His name that he told Moses is I am or I exist, right? Mm -hmm. And so when the Jews are asking Jesus a bunch of questions, I have it here in John 8, 5. The Jews ask him and said, you're not 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus says to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Uh and that's that. That's that. So it's like, Jesus. You hear that. Yep. It's God, you hear that. God and Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so last two <coughs> questions and this is one that's been kind of fun each week is how many plagues do we have a record of <coughs> Tatia I don't know uh, Uncle Charlie I'm trying to think uh, 10 or 11 that is way up in there 10. good job 10? good job now okay. do you guys think do you guys think out of the 10 plagues, could you name three on your own? Let's see. Uh, let's see. One of the, uh, the locusts, the frogs, and, uh, and the, uh, killing the, what, the firstborn or something like that. Yes, that is, that is the big one. That, I'm, I'm glad you said that one. So I have them here, and we're just going to breeze through them because I don't want to take any other time away. But we have water to blood. We had the frogs. 
We had the lice. Oh, lice. Oh, yeah, Awful. Yeah. The flies. Flies. We had the death of the livestock. Oh, Here's the nasty one. We had the boils. Ugh. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then Uncle Charlie, every week, this is so since we've been doing this, you're the one who said hail. <laughs> so we got hail. We got locust. We had darkness. And then oh. last, lastly was the death of the firstborn, which is where we learn about the Passover, right? <laughs> and they were being penalized. They were being punished for not recognizing God. And so the Jews were preserved by the death of a clean animal, the lamb. And they selected it on the 10th day. And on the 14th day, they slaughtered it. And Jesus is our Passover lamb. Because <laughs> Romans 6 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then we ask the question, has God, has, has the Bible in God's word, is there anywhere that just says plainly that Jesus is our Passover lamb? And uh, we can look to what John the Baptist says, is that in the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we see that there. From John the Baptist. <laughs> Chapter 13, we talked about the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. We also talked about the cloud by day and fire by night, which Uncle Charlie responded to, how it was a sign of protection and direction and, and also, uh, whatchamacallit, comfort from the sun. You know, it's going to be hot. Chapter 14 was, I, I titled it Pharaoh's Last Stand, but, you know, Moses... Moses, through God, uh, parts the Red Sea, and we know that it was a, a heavy part of the sea, and we've actually learned through some of the other archaeological discoveries where it was at, and it's deep. It's not just waist high, and Pharaoh's armies and all his men rush in to catch the Jews, and um, the waters are released on top of them, and they all die, and we see their bodies floating around. We see that we have images here from the 70s where Ron White went down there and, and uh, theorized where some of these events had taken place and sees these uh, archaeological records of them. When that happens, they sing a song of redemption. This is the greatest thing in the world. Oh, my gosh, there's none like our God. He's the greatest God in the world. He provides for us. He's taken us out of our enemies. And then the next chapter, we see that, uh, what did you do, Moses? You brought us out here to die. Was there not enough tombs in Egypt? <laughs> we're going to die out here because we're thirsty. So that's when we see Moses striking the rock. When he, he consults with God and asks for guidance, God says to strike the rock. And the people are given water. <laughs> then all of a sudden, these people, the Amalekites, come out there. And they go after uh, you know Moses and Moses' left-hand man, Joshua. And they go into battle. And the, the Israelites, those of Jacob... Win the battle as long as Moses' arms were being held up in the air, right? So there's a there's the win there. We talked about the ages of the patriarchs and how they would have had direct conversation. And then we see Moses' father-in-law giving him counsel on how he should split up the nation so that people can not be burdened with just him whenever they have a problem. And he's teaching them the law. And then we talked about how is it that Moses could be teaching them the law before the law had been given. And so we went through the first eight chapters of Genesis and saw many instances where God had instituted um, various laws. And there was a reckoning for people for being evil. And so they had to, you have to know the right from wrong at that standpoint. Um, now, that kind of enters us into this one scene right here. And I have highlighted the section from last week because it was, it was interesting for me to read. But God is telling Moses to tell the Egyptians that you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. And then I have this section highlighted for a reason. Last week, we talked about the first part of this uh, scripture, chapter verse four there. And we talked about how it sounded a lot like 
the chapter in Matthew where it what's going to happen when where the eagle is there the carcass carcass will be also we saw how there was carcasses all in the water right there it's like Israel was baptized in the Red Sea they came out they were preserved by God he gathered them up in eagle's wings just just like what he said in the last verse and behind them there's carcasses everywhere so it seems as though it's a fulfillment of that particular scripture of what's going to happen in the future that's there for us that's what this, that's what the text is here for us for that reason and so the reason why I've highlighted this section here is we'll learn later on in the Bible that the people are upset that Aaron was chosen to be a, of the priestly service. And we see here in these verses that God is giving this level of entitlement. And this is one of those, this is from Skip Heitzig. And I, I lean on him on a lot of these things because I feel like he's fairly accurate. But again, remember, read it for yourself, not just, don't just trust me. <laughs> so uh, he says, and, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So these people shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. However, as we go on and we read, which I believe we stopped in chapter 25. So I'm going to, I'm going to really breeze through these. God descends his presence onto Mount Sinai. Moses goes up. And as Moses is up there, God tells Moses to go back down because the, he needs to warn the people about breaking through the barrier that Moses had set, lest they die from his Shekinah glory, which is the glory of God. It's so powerful that man can't be there, right? And so there's a bunch of different things that need to transpire for them to be clean themselves from the, the, their sin that they have, so on and so forth. And... Um, Moses and Moses goes up a certain way uh, to the top of the mountain. And this is where he receives on the top of the mountain, uh, the God's 10 commandments. But as we will read tonight, it's not just 10 commandments, right? Because it wasn't God, God gave him these, 10, God gave him these 10 commandments. And then he went down with these tablets that had the 10 commandments on them. He's up there for a minute right? So these were the 10 commandments that were given and all the people witnessed what was going on. They heard the flashes of lightning. They stood afar off and the people saw it. They trembled and stood afar off. And while they were standing afar off and Moses comes down to speak with them, they say to him, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. So it's, this is one of those, I'm tying this into that other scripture that we had highlighted we see an instance here where it seems as though the people rejected their title as priests and gave it and appointed it to Moses or whoever God would appoint at that point because they were concerned about being consumed with his holy fire, right? And just, just the presence of God itself, God, God himself, right? So that got us through Mount Sinai. And one of the things very important here, the tail end of that one uh, chapter 20 it says then the lord said to moses thus you shall say to the children of israel you have seen that i have talked with you from heaven you shall not make anything to be with me gods of silver gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves okay do not make gods of silver or gods of gold god is a jealous god only him and then we see god saying what we do when it comes to slaves and restitution we then also talked about what would happen if there was a donkey in a pit and how we would how we would repay that man and what happens if people steal. And this is the laying down of the law it came to, you know, if someone tries to entice a woman who's betrothed and the, the various things that would go along that way. In chapter 23, we see circulating a false report. Do not be a wick. It is do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. OK, don't do evil. Um there's also a law that's put down on the land. Six years, you shall sow your land and gather its produce. But in the seventh year, you shall let it rest. Why? This is God's uh, welfare program. Because in the seventh year of that land, in the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days, you shall do work. Seventh day, you shall rest that your ox and your donkey may rest 
and the son of your female servants and the stranger may be refreshed. So again, lots of emphasis on the Sabbath there. And then in chapter 23, we see that God is going to send his angel. And this is, this was something that we had some debate about or not. I wouldn't call it debate. We just did a little bit more research into is this speaking of Jesus at a, a form of Jesus, a Christophany, so to speak, where was this form of Jesus appearing in the old Testament prior to his birth. And, um, or is this literally just an angel like the angel Gabriel or one of those along those lines? Um, and we were also drawn to the statement where Jesus said, or when Moses says, uh, Moses went up Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And we said, well, in the new Testament, Jesus records that no one has seen the father except he who is from God has seen the father referring to himself. And so this was one of those things where he said, is this an apparent contradiction? And we read this, or we watched this video, if you guys recall, and it was, it was very well done explaining on what a theophany is and a Christophany and how God presents himself as an image before people, because if God's holiness descends down on someone, that they will be consumed with this fire because we're so unrighteous and unworthy. We can't even be in the presence of God because of this. And we see, as we read further on, we'll see that God wants to, Moses wants to see God and Moses is unable to, he has to turn his back a certain way and, and we'll see all those things. So it makes more sense in this statement here, like what that other gentleman said, is that there's a form that God allowed them to witness. And, you know, they looked at the, what was underneath his feet, looked like a paved work of sapphire stone. But while this is taking place, I just want to put special note here on the very last verse that I highlighted. And this was almost where we finished last week. And that is Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and for 40 nights. So we could get, we could receive the 10 commandments from God in a few minutes, 40 minutes and bring them down. There was a lot going on up there at this time. Okay. And we talked about that. That's the video we watched. And that puts us to where we're at today. Session six. I got a question. Yes. Uh, didn't Aaron do, did Aaron do a lot of, like, a lot of talking for Moses? Cause he had, I don't know, some kind of a speech impediment or something or anything like that. Um, so yes. Aaron was the spokesperson for Moses, it seems, yeah. in Egypt. Remember how Aaron was the person that was always talking for him? But we're going to yeah. learn here in the chapters that follow is that Moses is going up and doing these things specifically by himself. And the person that's there next to him is Joshua. And it's not, it's not there in the presence with God. And I don't know if Joshua could hear these things, but... Joshua was waiting for him. And we're going to read about that right now. But during this time that they're up there, 40 days, 40 nights, right? He's going to get all this instruction, which is what we read. And it's going to be about the tabernacle. It's going to be how to build these things. So I'm just going to read through these items. And I'll stop when there's something that um, was, it's all of mention, but just something of what others had mentioned specifically. So chapter 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they will bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skin, dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just so you shall make it and they shall make an ark of acacia wood two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height and you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out, you shall overlay it. 
and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half <laughs> width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. And you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Here's a sample image of the um, the table. Okay, this is verses 23 through 30, where it talks about this um, table that's going to be carried in for the food, right? And here's an image from one of the websites. That's it's a really poor image, unfortunately, but those would be the 12 pieces of bread that are made without leaven, and they one each re represents each tribe, right, of the 12 tribes of Jacob. That's one what? heavy table with all that gold. I know, right? So you shall also yeah. make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around. You shall make it for a frame of a hand breadth all around. You shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. You shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. The ring shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece, and six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lamp side, that lampstand on out of one side, and three branches out of the lampstand on the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an or ornamental knob and a flower. And so for six branches that come out of the lampstand on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches the same according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand, their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make, sorry, you shall make seven lamps for it and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it and its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. And it shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Okay. So the, 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 this particular item, and again, this is just an, a rendering of this. And there is, remember we talked about that, that particular group in Israel called the Temple Institute that's building these types of items to prepare for the, the rebuilding of the temple. They've built one of these. They have it on display. They believe 
based on all of these various uh, sources, including the Bible, that they have an accurate version of what it's supposed to look like, and they've built it as as described. Okay. Hey, Elia, how much is that talent? I don't remember. We'll look that up before this is over. But I'm going to keep going because we're going to get into the tabernacle. So, moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine woven linen and blue and purple and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits. You remember what a cubit is, right? About 18 inches. About 18 inches, the distance from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. <clears throat> and the width of each curtain, four cubits. And every one of these curtains shall have the same measurement. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the selvage of one set. And likewise, you shall do on the outer edge of the out other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain, that is, on the end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped one to another. And you shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple their curtains together with the clasps, so that it may be one tabernacle. You shall also make curtains of goat, goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain four cubits, and the 11 curtains shall all have the same measurement. And you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. Oh, I think I said that one twice. Uh, okay. And you shall couple the five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent, and you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is the outermost one in set, and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set, and you shall make 50 bronze clasps and put the clasps in the loops and couple the tent together, and it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half of the curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle, and a cubit on the side and a cubit on the other side of what remains, the lengths of the curtain shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle, on this side, on that side, to cover it. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. And for the tabernacle, you shall make boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of the board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of the board of each board. Two tenons shall be in each board for binding one together. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards, for it is two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the far side of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six boards and you shall also make two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them and they shall be for the two to, for the two together at the bottom. Yeah, no, two corners. Sorry guys. So there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards and you shall make bars. And you shall make bars of acacia wood five for the boards on the side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards on the side of the tabernacle for the far westward, for the far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold, make their rings of gold as holders of the bar, and overlay the bars with gold, and you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain." You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be the it shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood 
overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lamp stand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. And that's 37. Okay. 27. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. And you shall make its pans to receive its ashes, and its shovels, and its basins, and its forks, and its fire pits. I'm sorry, fire pans. You shall make all the utensils of bronze. You shall make a grate for it a network of bronze, and on the network you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath, that the network may be midway upon the altar, and you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. You shall make it hollow with boards, as it was shown you on the mountain, so shall they make it. You shall also make the court of the tabernacle for the south side. There shall be hangings for the court made of fine woven linen, 100 cubits long for one side, and its 70 pillars and their 20 sockets shall be bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be silver. Likewise, along the length of the north side, there shall be hangings 100 cubits long with its 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of bronze and the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver. And along the width of the court on the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets and the widths and the width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits. The hangings on the one side of the gate shall be 50 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets and on the other side shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets and all the pillars around and the court shall have bands of silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the width 50 throughout, and the height 5 cubits made of fine woven linen and its sockets of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle for all its services, all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be bronze. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend to it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. Okay. Now, I have... Oh, is this going to let me click on this? Nope. Okay. Let me see if this will let me highlight this. So I have a video here of an artist's rendering of this. And I'm going to pull it up real quick. I think this is it right here. 
is okay. Can you guys see this video? Yes. Okay. YouTube if you want to learn more about the tabernacle. So there's actually a live. They have one that they've built out in. I can't remember the name. I think this is it right here. Oh, no. This was another a church had built this. I think this one's in California. Uh, this one's in Huntington Beach. So uh, there, there's been a few churches that have done uh, buildings of these. There's one in the Middle East as well. That's complete two scale, two size. Obviously it's not solid gold. I can't imagine that they can fight off the individuals from stealing from there. But that's kind of an image of what we're looking at here, right? Can you guys see the slide now? Yes. Okay. So that's going to get us into chapter 28. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. So now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I filled, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister to me as a priest. So real quickly, I wanted to point out who has given the skill to be artisans? God. God has. Think about that. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod, a robes, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. Okay? So number one, God has given in-depth instructions, and it, it seems from the reading as though God has showed him already what they need to look like in some type of a visual a visual aid, like he gave him more than a PowerPoint. He showed him the items personally and then gave him skilled instructions on how to do it and then gave him individuals who had the skill to do it along with the equipment. I also think that it's interesting. I, I'm guessing that most of this equipment that they have here is the payment that they received when they were leaving Egypt and the people were just giving them all of their they called it plundering, but they were giving them all of what was due to them for their wages that they had worked while they were there. So moving on, uh, they shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, the fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together, and the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it 
shall be of the same workmanship, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six of their names on the other stone in order of their birth, which with work of engrave, which, I'm sorry, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the settings. You shall make the breastplate, breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square, a span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width, and you shall put settings of stones in it. Four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardis, a topaz, an emerald. Uh, lost my spot. An emerald this shall, this shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, and a gate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the 12 tribes. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold, and you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate, breastplate, and put the two rings in the two ends of the breastplate, and you shall put the two braided chains of the gold in the two rings, which are on the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the two braided chains you shall fasten to the two settings, and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. And two other rings of gold you shall take, you shall make, and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod toward its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod and so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around them, and bells of golds between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. You shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hollow in their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. You shall make the sash of woven work. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics and you shall make sashes for them. And you shall make hats for them for glory and beauty and you so you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. 
and you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his descendants after him. Okay. Here is an artist's rendering of what that would look like. You guys want to take a gander at that? I thought it was pretty cool to note, too, at the very bottom. You notice it says, walk in bare feet, standing on holy ground. <laughs> Remember how Moses was told to meet at the burning bush? Take his sandals off. Yeah, because he's on holy ground. But holy this ground. is, these are the different, uh, different items and the stones and whatnot and how it was embroidered in the colors. So, And on the head right there, we see that holiness to Yahweh. So we're going to move right into the next chapter. And we're just going to, like I said, we're going to keep chugging along. <laughs> so, and this is what you shall do to them to hollow them for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them into the basket with the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons, you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. And you shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban and you shall take the anointing oil pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring the, his sons and put tunics on them, and you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual state, so you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. You shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood besides the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull with its skin and its offal, you shall burn with fire outside the camp and it is a sin offering. You shall also take one ram and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram and you shall kill the ram and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around the altar. Then you shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and with its head. And you shall burn the whole ram on the altar it is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall also take the other ram and Aaron and his sons and put them, put their hands on their heads, on their head of the ram. Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around the altar and you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on their garments of his son with him, of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed and his sons and his garments shall be garments with him. Also, you shall take the fat of the ram, the fat of the tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the river, the two kidneys and the fat on them the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, one loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, and one water from the basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all these in his hand, in, his, in the hands of Aaron, and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it 
as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. And from the ram of the consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering, which was raised, of that which is for Aaron and of that which was for his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and, and his sons by a statute for ev- forever, for it is a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel from the sacrifices of their peace offerings, that is, their heave offering to the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them, that the son who becomes the priest in his place shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. And you shall take the ram of the consecration and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat those things which was, I'm sorry, with which the atonement was made and to consecrate and sanctify them. But an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the consecration offerings or of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them And you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. Sorry. Um, With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel and go to the, er, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Okay. This is... Moses anointed here, or this is Moses anointing Aaron. Um, we're gonna see. Whoa, I skipped real fast. How much time we got? We got two minutes. Okay, should have spent less time in the review. Um, let's just stop there. We'll stop there instead of trying to rush through it. Uh, we're now going to enter into the altar of incense. And let me grab our little homework page, slide 63. Homework for you, Monef. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. And then our homework will be from to read from chapter 30 to, we'll call it 35. Let's do till 35. Yeah. Can you guys see that or no? Yes, we chapter 30, 35. Watch this video. Oh, YouTube. yeah. This is, I want you guys to watch this video if you get a chance. And what I can do is I can, I can put it up here. It was really, really well done. And it's about, it's almost two hours. I watched it the other night. Um, and it just, it kind of gives a really good insight into where 
we get the text from the Bible from, so on and so forth. And it's called The God Who Speaks. You may have already seen it. It's a big group of pastors. There's a, there's a ton of them. And they're, they're basically all, they all excel in their field. And it's an hour and 31 minutes. And I can text it to you guys if you'd like. But I put the link up here on the screen. So if you wanted to watch the recording, this would be it. But uh, I'll send it to you guys in a text message. How about that? Yeah. And then the question. Let's go ahead and stop the recording. Wait a minute. Where's all that stuff at? There we go. Yeah.